Welcome to My Refrigerator. This is Megan Martins Hayworth, your host for Art Fridge Art History. Today we're going to be talking about the painting American Gothic by Grant Wood. Hello and welcome to Art Fridge Art History. This is episode 8 of Art Fridge. Sorry for the delay. I was finishing up my academic year at the college and now I'll be able to start recording again. So like I said, this is episode 8 and today we're going to cover American Gothic by Grant Wood. This is the painting and it's currently at the Chicago Institute of Art and it's called American Gothic by Grant Wood who was an American artist appropriately. And this was an oil painting on what's called beaver board panel. It was a type of um, paneling they used in construction sometimes. And this was painted in 1930, and it measures 30 and 3 quarters inches by 25 and 3 quarters inches. Let's talk a little bit more about Grant Wood. So I have some images here to show you, a photograph of him as well as a painted self-portrait. And then his boyhood home in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So he was actually born in 1891 on a farm in Iowa, about four miles east of Anamosa. I hope I'm saying that right, Iowa. And he is most famous for his depictions of rural American life, especially from the Midwest and specifically um, from the state of Iowa where he's from. So I wanted to show you this image as well. This is an image of his studio, which was in the top of a carriage house that he and his mother had lived in for years. And after she passed and he had a home, he uh, used it as his studio. So this is an image of Grant Wood in his characteristic overalls in his studio in 1931. He's most famous for doing landscapes and being the leader of a group called the Regionalists. In American art, the Regionalists wanted to develop a specifically American style of art that wasn't derivative of the styles going on with the avant-garde in Europe, the styles that were popular at the time. And so he wanted to kind of develop a uniquely American perspective and style and he and other artists like Thomas Hart Benton and John Stuart Curry worked to those ends so he was really famous for doing landscapes he did some portraits like we were going to see but these are kind of the famous images like this one of Stone City Iowa where he started basically an art colony but he does highly stylized paintings like if you look at this one you can see a heavy repetition of pattern and kind of puffy round looking trees and there's definitely a stylization that we see with Wood's work. But he's not as famous for his landscapes as he is for his breakthrough painting. Okay, so American Gothic with its stern faced depictions of a man and kind of a sour looking woman, right, um, is what propelled him to fame and they stand in front of a kind of white gothic style uh, window on a farmhouse and it made Wood a national celebrity. He he did lecture circuits and interviews and things like that and I have this quote from him about finding this house. So let's talk a little bit about what inspired this painting and this quote. He was in a town called Eldon, Iowa currently has a population of 738 and he was being shown around the town and we'll get to that in just a moment but he said I saw a trim white cottage with a trim white porch a cottage built on severe gothic lines this gave me an idea that idea was to find two people who by their severely straight laced characters would fit into such a home and so let's talk a little bit about this house so Here's the state of Iowa we can see here. And that red pinpoint shows that it's kind of in southeastern Iowa, south of Des Moines and Cedar Rapids, where he lived. 
And he had come to Eldon, and, and the little map there below shows where the American Gothic house is. And he was being driven around in August 1930 by an artist friend who had grown up there. He was in town because he was invited to attend an art show. And it was during this tour of the town with his friend that he saw this little white house with this large gothic window in the top of it. And he said, you know, stop. <laughs> and he quickly sketched out a drawing of the house on a used envelope because that's the only piece of paper he had available to him at the moment. Later, he came back. So let's talk a little bit about that. He did not immediately think of the house as beautiful, but he did kind of find amusement in that kind of big and fancy gothic window in the gables. He kind of found that captivating and went ahead and painted it. Um, but his earliest biographer, Daryl Garwood, revealed that Wood thought it a form of borrowed pretentiousness, a structural absurdity. Um, to put a gothic style window like this in such a flimsy frame of a house and Wood described it as you know one of many kind of cheaply built farmhouses in the area um, and but he liked the character and decided to go ahead and paint it so those windows were believed to be installed to make the home more decorative or beautiful and that's written in a lot of accounts of it um, the style of the house is called carpenter gothic and um it was kind of popular to build kind of these simple board and batten homes, but put like a little fancier windows in them to, to kind of pretty them up a little bit. Um, but what's interesting I read is that that window up above in the gable there was actually on hinges, that the window hinged so that it could be opened to get furniture into or out of the upper floor of the house because the inner stairway had a really tight corner that you can get furniture up. So it actually served as a function, not just a kind of pretty statement in the gable. But anyway, Wood probably never knew that. He asked the Jones family, who was living in the home at the time, for permission to make a more detailed sketch. And so came back and he did so using oil on a paperboard in front of the house in the yard. And this sketch uh, displayed like a steeper roof line and a longer window than the actual house's window. And he had not added the figures in at this time when he was working on the sketch, and he didn't put the figures in until he returned to Cedar Rapids. Although Wood never returned to Eldon, he did request a photograph of the home to complete his painting. And he rarely explained his work, so he did not clarify his choice of this house. People have wondered if he is mocking the inclusion of the window as a homeowner's choice to make an ordinary house look more grander than it is, or maybe he was honoring the efforts the homeowners took and the additional expense that they incurred to make an artistic statement that was kind of more beautiful than anything, um, but not otherwise needed, which we know is probably not true. They probably used it to get furniture in, but either way, he didn't make the choice by chance. His attention to details and careful arrangement of things lend quite a bit of importance to his choice of house. Okay, so here it is again, so you can kind of see the changes that he made in the house. And here's that preliminary sketch where the man is holding a rake, if you look closely, instead of a pitchfork. So obviously he made some changes. After struggling to find the right models in Cedar Rapids, he said, I finally induced my own maiden sister to pose and had her comb her hair straight down her ears with a severely plain part in the middle. Then he said, I sent to Chicago Mail Order House for the prim colonial print apron my sister wears. We're not exactly sure why he chose the gentleman who was his dentist um, to be the model for the man, except for that Grant Wood said that he liked the long lines of the man's face. Okay, so maybe it was just that he looked kind of stern and kind of down to earth or kind of folky. Um, but anyway, he chose his dentist as the model for the man. And so here is his sister, uh, Nan Wood Graham, and Dr. B. H. McKeeby, the side American Gothic that they modeled for. Okay, so. The pose is something we also need to kind of talk about and the, the arrangement of how he did this. So 
The way he had the figures standing in front of the home does recall an American tradition that I wanted to talk about from the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So in the 1800s, when photography was kind of in its infancy, it became common for traveling photographers to go from place to place and pose the inhabitants in front of their homes, like you see in front of all these homesteads throughout the West and Midwest. A lot of these images come from Nebraska, North Dakota, and so on. But the families would sit out in front of their homes and be photographed in front of their, no matter how modest the home was. And you can see here some sod homes in the prairies. So, you know, he's probably echoing what you see here where no matter how humble your situation, your home is a, a point of pride, no matter how you know basic or humble it is. So that's probably why he placed them in the foreground like this when he, the way he did. His sister, as you can see, is placed on one side next to the home's porch. You can see behind her shoulder the porch with some plants on it. And that was probably symbolic of the woman, uh, uh, you know, the household taking care of interior domestic matters. And if you look behind the man, you can see the barn. So that indicates his role, uh, you know, is working the land outside of the home. So there is some symbolism here that he's using. There also may be great significance to the two potted plants on the porch behind his sister's head, as you can see here. One um, of the plants is a begonia called a beefsteak begonia, and the other is a mother's-in-law tongue, or sansevieria. And he used them again in a portrait, as you can see here in the center, of his mother, Hattie Weaver Wood, titled Woman with Plants. Wanda Korn, who is a leading scholar on wood and an author of a book called Grant Wood, The Regionalist Vision, speculates that it's the hardiness of the mothers-in-law tongue that made it popular with pioneer women and that his use of the plant may be an allusion to kind of their hardiness and the uprightness of these women. Okay, The begonia perhaps is just there for formal composition um, because it's kind of lobes, right? It's the leaves, it's kind of rounded leaves look like um, the trees in the background of American Gothic. And he could just be reusing elements um, from one painting to the next. This portrait of his mother was painted in 1929 in American Gothic in 1930. And it's possible that those potted plants behind the shoulder of his sister there are representative of a mother type figure. That's my speculation. Um, that's not really anything I read from the art historians that I read, but more me thinking about how if he's using those same two plants exactly, and there's a question about who this woman is to this man, then it could be that those plants are representative of a mother. For instance, um, let's talk a little bit about this. As I mentioned before, the model for the female figure is his sister, his younger sister, Nan Wood, Graham. And his depiction of this woman didn't really do Nan any favors, right? Um, but anyway, some have argued that it's a farmer and his wife, but Nan really held to the fact that it's supposed to be a farmer and his daughter, okay? Maybe it's out of vanity, I don't know. But um, if that's true, then those plants on the back porch could represent an absent mother, right? The fact that maybe the mother has passed or something like that, and this man and this daughter um, kind of go on without her, right? So that's just my read of those plants, and maybe their symbolism there. Anyway, I mentioned the model is his sister, and American Gothic had cemented Wood's fame, but many Midwesterners, especially Iowans, view the painting with suspicion and anger. Many felt that the image was a cruel satire of rural Midwestern farm life, and there was even a letter-writing campaign by, like, a lot of Iowa farmers' wives to protest their depiction in this painting and how Eastern critics, especially those out of New York, were kind of critiquing Iowa and the women. Anyway, they just felt that it was unflattering and it made them look backwards, out of touch, ugly, and dour. Um, one farmer's wife even wrote that about his sister. Keep in mind that when they were writing this, they weren't totally aware it was his sister. 
that they said that woman's face could positively sour milk. Such comments were believed to have been made and hurt his sister, <laughs> hurt her feelings, who was quickly recognized as the model. She said that after Grant painted American Gothic, I was kidded so much about it that it bothered Grant. Although I was very proud to have posed for American Gothic, Grant thought I might be hurt underneath, so he decided to paint another portrait of me. So, yeah, he doesn't really flatter his sister much here. She doesn't look like she's a ton of fun. So he gave it another try, and he painted this portrait. Okay, This becomes a very important portrait to Wood. He did it as kind of an apology to Nan, but he ends up keeping it. And not only that, he ends up keeping it for the rest of his life. It's one of the very, very few paintings of this mature style that he actually kept, but he did keep it. And it kind of is a representation of how very close they were. They were born eight years apart. Nan was the youngest of his uh, three siblings, and the pair shared a very deep bond. Wood even took financial responsibility for both his sister and his mother throughout his life. And this portrait was, to him, a heartfelt apology for kind of the harsh words that were inadvertently leveled at his sister by viewers and critics because he painted her. It could also be his attempt to reconcile his standing in Iowa, although the, uh, to those who thought American Gothic had disparaged Midwesterners, right? Kind of redemption for them. The elements in this portrait are still very Americana, but they show a fashionable young woman instead of a dour farmer's daughter. Nan sits here on an American Hitchcock chair with her hands in her lap, holding a chick and a plum. She's kind of facing leftwards, but she's looking at the viewer with kind of a half smile on her face, earning her the nickname America's Mona Lisa, which kind of stuck with her the rest of her night life. I would rather be called America's Mona Lisa than a dour woman who could sour milk. So I'm sure she was somewhat pleased with this representation. <laughs> okay. So in this portrait, he shows an interest in some of the Northern Renaissance stylings that he saw while he was in Europe. Um, I'll talk about his trip to Europe here in a few moments. But he was interested in Northern Renaissance details and symbolism. And so when we look at those meticulous details that we see throughout any of his paintings, especially in this one, that chick and the plum that Nan is holding, it doesn't appear to be just formal, like riffing off of the yellows in her hair, you know, and the chick and the plum reflecting kind of the wallpaper, you know, or wall behind. Instead, they are probably symbolic, okay? There is some thoughts here that the plum in her hands could Traditionally, the plum has been associated with femininity and the chick, you know, kind of this vulnerable little tender thing could be a representation of how he feels, you know, towards his uh, younger sister, that kind of warmth that he feels or that care that he feels for her. We are not sure, but definitely there is some importance there. He also depicts her with this really trendy, what's called Marcelled hairstyle, this kind of waves that you see wearing a contemporary polka-dotted blouse that he designed expressly for this portrait, which I found really interesting. The ribbons that you see tied at her shoulders, especially the shoulder closest to the viewer, are important. If you look at it, it looks like a bat. <laughs> and I think it was kind of a little joke, an inside joke for his sister. She said he called her an old bat. Maybe she kind of had that kind of old lady attitude. I don't know. But... He called her an old bat, and so it's probably a little insider joke that her shoulder tie looks like a bat. Okay. Anyway, after Wood's death in 1942, um, Nan gained possession of his remaining artworks, including Portrait of Nan. Like I said, he kept it with him, and she would inherit it. But apparently, she didn't find it very flattering. I find that really interesting. It's much more flattering than American Gothic. I read somewhere that she actually had people paint over his painting. Um, it's The quote I read said, she had one of Grant's people give her a facelift. And another artist ended up adding lipstick, 
trimmed down her nose and gave her a nose job and smoothed out the skin on her neck and upper arms. Fortunately, this painting has been restored. In 2018, when the Whitney Museum of American Art had an exhibition of his work in New York City, the painting was conserved by Simon Parks, who is a famous conservator, and he removed the overpainting of Nan's face, including the nose and all that stuff. He removed all that and brought it back to its original form. Thank goodness, right? Another thing that I wanted to point out in Portrait of Nan is this little detail of that you know, metal um, curtain pull kind of holding back the curtain. Okay. So this has to do with the fact that it is June and we are currently celebrating Pride. And it's a clue to his homosexuality that was very thoroughly hidden during his lifetime from the general public. But we, I wanted to talk about him for Pride. So in this portrait of Nan, you see that brass fixture, right? And the painting's background, you can look closely and see the Star of David. There's a Star of David type of design. And that references a time when Wood went to Munich, Germany in 1928 with the rise of the Nazis. He went there to work on a stained glass window commission with some experts. And he traveled around Germany looking at art. But while he was there, um, he saw Nazi anti-Semitism and assaults on openly gay people. And Wood never forgot that and the horrors he saw. Although Wood wasn't Jewish, um, he was gay. And the memory of Nazi aggression against Jews and homosexuals clearly affected him and made its way covertly into his work. I don't think anybody at the time that would have seen this would have probably understood what that meant, right? So he kind of had to hide it, but it was there. Wood's closest friends knew he was gay, and after his mother died, he kind of panicked about being outed because he no longer had the excuse of being a bachelor because he was taking care of an elderly mother, right? And so he ended up in a disastrous and very short-lived marriage with a, an actress, and his friends called it a mistake from the beginning. Unfortunately for him, he, during that time, fell in love with her son and would lavish gifts on him. But his love for this, this young man was unrequited. Then, near the end of his life, he fell in love with and lived with the writer and assistant, um, his personal assistant or secretary, Park Renard. But apparently their relationship was unrequited as well, although Renard stayed with him until he died from pancreatic cancer in the hospital. Unfortunately, times were very different, and Cedar Rapids um, tolerated people that were LBGTQ as long as they were virtually invisible. They could live their lives without being harassed as long as they didn't live out. Therefore, he had to hide it from nearly everyone. I read that one of the bartenders who knew him said that Wood was only gay when he was drunk, which is pretty sad, actually. So, in fact, in his last years, it got worse. Wood nearly lost his teaching job at the University of Iowa School of Art because five of his colleagues there, led by the department chair, Lester Longman, tried to get him fired on moral grounds. They made allusions to him being gay for sure, and they also seemed to have issue with his style of painting because it wasn't considered avant-garde enough, right? But they definitely made allusions to him being gay, and the university would end up dismissing Longman's allegations against Wood and reinstate him as professor but it came a little too late because Wood was already dying of pancreatic cancer and he never returned to his teaching position. This all shows how dangerous it was to be outed at that time. And unfortunately, even though they were very close, Nan seemed to also have never approved of his sexuality either. During my research, I read a comment from a Wood family friend who knew Nan and who also knew Park Renard and this person commented that they had no idea that Grant Wood was gay, saying that, of course, Nan would not have spoken of it. So there was something about Nan where she didn't necessarily want to talk about that. Despite all of that, 
When he died, he left everything to her. And as a way to help preserve her, his legacy, Nan would also try to lead a grassroots movement to preserve an, the American Gothic house in Eldon, Iowa. She started that effort in 1945, but not much was done until 1960. In 1960, a visit to the decaying house by Des Moines architect and historian William J. Wagner capped these early efforts. He was one of the first to suggest preservation of the house as an historic site, and it has since come to pass. <laughs> okay, so the owners of the house will eventually uh, gift it to the state of Iowa to preserve as a historical site, and today, a trip to Eldon, Iowa will reward you with an excellent photo op with the house. So there is now a visitor center and uh, props that you can pose with. They have aprons and jackets of all sizes, and they also supply visitors with pitchforks so they can go out and pose in front of the house, and they're encouraged to. So this is their website, and I was clicking through it, and I, I saw things like the use of costumes by the public will be determined on a day-to-day -day basis based on whether or not uh, sorry, based on weather and staff availability for costume distribution, but pitchforks are always available to borrow during the center's hours of operation. So anyway, I guess they really have played into it in Eldon and um, have gone ahead and built that visitor center with information about wood and the painting, and they even, on certain days of the month, give tours of the first floor of the house. So in one of the recent years, I think before the pandemic, there were as many as 15,000 visitors a year who registered with the Visitor Center and probably many more who probably came when it was closed. And visitors, like I said, are encouraged to stand outside and take their photos taken, and I found plenty of those on the internet. The American Gothic House Center, which you see here, the Visitor Center, was completed in 2007 and it contains exhibits about the community, the painting, Grant Wood, and all those. And the town of Eldon has really embraced the iconic painting as its own. In fact, each June, the city of Eldon holds its Gothic Day Festival, um, a celebration of the painting and rural life in Eldon in the 1930s. And so they have like a like several days of events and fun, as you can see there, like many small town Americans do. In my hometown, it's called Fun Days, right? I'm from a small town too. Um, so the painting has earned its place in the pantheon of great American paintings. And you know it's iconic because it has spawned thousands of parodies. I just picked three, but there are hundreds of parodies of it. And it's that famous, it's that iconic. As always, thank you for joining me for Art Fridge Art History. If you like what you saw, please hit that subscribe button. Thank you. See you next time.